talking this morning about honoring Christ through our family. And what a time to talk about that, right, as we come on to, up to Thanksgiving. Uh, in, in the years of ministry, I've understood this, and, and maybe you understand this, that Thanksgiving and the holiday season can be one of the best seasons for people as they gather with family. And because they gather with family, and it can also be one of the more difficult periods of time because they gather with family. Does that make sense? Because not everybody's coming from the same family background, and not all um, family relationships are great. And we know that, and we pray to God that his word in Ephesians would help us. In Ephesians, we've been looking at this theme of grace for the battle, that Paul, who had been persecuting the church, stood there and watched Stephen stoned to death, was having Christians arrested, had become a Christian, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he writes this, this letter to the church of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was the area where they had a lot of false worship. They had the temple of Artemis. And he writes there, and he tells the, the Christian, the believers in Christ there, that they have been chosen by God that they have been redeemed by the Son, and that they are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And that they have been saved from their sin. They have been saved from the works of the devil. They no longer have to live in fear of the demonic forces. That they have been set free from guilt and shame and the righteous anger of God and made right with God through Christ. And that they no longer have to live being conformed to this world, but they can be transformed. And how are they saved? Well, they've been saved by grace, the unmerited favor of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And he's prayed for them twice, and he wants them to understand and to know God. He wants them to be rooted and grounded in love. He wants them to understand the work of of the Holy Spirit in them, empowering them to live differently, to, to, to understand that God is able to do immeasurably more than we could even ask or think. Praise the Lord. And, and he wants them to understand that they were not set free to just sit around, but they, they've been called by God to good works, which were given for them in advance. There's a purpose for their life, and that's to be light in a dark world and point people to Jesus. They should walk, that they should live in a way worthy of the Savior who's called them. What Paul writes to the church of Ephesus it's meant to be read by us and applied in our lives. Amen. And if you're here and you've asked Christ to be the Savior of your life, you've asked Christ to be the boss of your life, you've asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit, then you can know this. You've been chosen by God. You've been redeemed by the Son, and you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And God has a purpose for you to be light in a dark world. Amen. And, and, and your being here is not by accident. Your being at the job that you're at is not by accident. God has a purpose for your life. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to. And you can. Simply ask Christ to forgive your sins, to be the Lord of your lives, and his Holy Spirit to fill you. Amen. Last week we talked about, well, how, how do we live that faith out? How, how do we become light in a dark world? And we talked about marriage. The idea in Scripture that we are to be submissive one to another, wives to their husbands. But that was such a beautiful picture. I said, but because it could be misunderstood. Because the wife is submitting to the servant spiritual leadership of the husband. And the husband is willing to lay down his life for his wife. Amen? It's a sad thing. I said in our Explorers class during the Sunday school hour, 
It's a sad thing, but it's true that you can say what the Bible says and not mean what the Bible means. True? And so people can say things and quote scripture, but not get at the real meaning. And you cannot take what we're reading here and rip it out of its context. This letter to the church in Ephesus is meant to be read in its entirety. So I, I highly, highly recommend that you read the whole thing. Amen? And, and before we get too far here, would you pray that God would speak to you for, through his word? Dear God, as we, as we come to your word, we, we come thirsty and hungry to know you better, Lord. To walk more closely to you, and, and we pray for your help, and we're thankful for your mercy. Help us to hear what we need to hear from your word today and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, and the people said, I'm going to give you a little background because we're meant to spend time in the Word. And if you read through this Bible, what you're going to find is that God loves children. God values children. It matters to God how we treat children. Just a couple places I'm going to show you that. Matthew 19, 13 through 15. Then children were brought to him, to Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Or Matthew 18. 2 and 6, 2 through 6, and calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never inherit the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one of such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great Millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Do you get the concept there that, that, that the Lord cares about kids? That's why we care and speak against, as a church, the taking of human life in the womb. It's why as a church we care and we speak against any education that would call for mutilation of children. Or promote confusion about who God called them to be. It's why we speak against sex trafficking. It's why we had to work in Columbia. It's because we care because the heart of our Savior is to care for and to love children. Amen? Psalm 127, 3 and 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. What's the point here? The point is this. You know, I have seven children. By the way, I was telling somebody, if you want to open a conversation in this area, don't start by telling them you're a Baptist minister with seven kids. That pretty much is done with the conversation. Um, but I said this before. It's interesting when you tell people you have seven children, how few people say you're very blessed. Our culture, I'm going to suggest to you that our culture does not value children the way it should. Amen? 
Amen. I believe with all my heart that we were created to love God and to love people for the glory of God. And we were called to be about the business of making disciples who make disciples. Do you know what that means? That means we're supposed to follow Jesus and help other people follow Jesus. Amen? One of my favorite memories was being in Mongolia with my son. We um, were with sports ambassadors, got to play the national team. It was kind of my last chance to, to play basketball uh, on that kind of team. Um, and I, it was just a delight because I got to have my son Noah with me, and he was playing on the team. And uh, one night we just went to a, a local park, and he, he took his guitar, and he began to, to play some popular American songs, and the kids started to gather around. Uh, you know, some of you know my son. He loves to play the guitar and sing and more and more, and they were, they were making requests of American songs. Uh, and then Noah said, I'd like to sing you a song that reminds me about how much my Jesus loves children. And then a song I learned when I was little, and, and, he, and he sang, Jesus Loves Me. And that was such a powerful thing to me, to see kids understand that God loves them and has a p- purpose for them. Amen? Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 is where we're at. It says, children, obey your parents. Now, at the beginning, it said, be submissive one to another, wives to husbands. And then it doesn't bring up the word submissive. It does put here the word obey. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for that is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, for, for further reading, reading, if you want, you could look at Colossians 3, 18 through 25. I, I um, do not have that on screen, so if you're looking for it, John, you won't find it, because this is an additional homework assignment, and you'll see a, a similar theme in what Paul writes there to the church. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. I do want to take a look at this. Look carefully, then, how you walk. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to give you some context. Remember where we've been. This is earlier, before this, where he's writing in the fifth chapter, and he says, look carefully, then, how you walk. In other words, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time. Think about that. Using, making the best use of the time. Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to stop and make a comment here. I have for years done a biblical counseling, and I have talked to a lot of individuals, and I have seen the devastating effects of drunkenness and alcohol abuse on families. Amen? Kids that, that, that didn't know what, ex- what to expect of dad because they didn't know if he'd come home as a raging drunk or as a sober father. I say that to, be, to say this. It's saying, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the same way that, that alcohol would have such a bad influence on those, on those fathers, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit of God in such a way that it influences everything that we do. Amen? Now, by the way, who's this message for? This is for, if, if you're here today and you are a parent, this is, this is for you. If you have parents, this is for you, so I I think that makes it for everybody, right? And do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he um, is going to jump. 
um, to talking about, not jump, he's going to talk about the relationship of husbands and wives and how that is really a picture of Christ's relationship to the church. We talked about that last week. And, and then we're going to jump in today to parents. But I want to, I want to sh- show you, he's already told you and I that what we sing matters. Did you hear that? What you sing matters. So if you're going to be a father and a mother leading your kids, it matters the music they listen to. Right? If you don't know what's on the playlist, your Spotify list for your child, you should. Because music has a powerful impact, does it not? So he's telling us we should be singing songs uh, that, that bring glory to God. I'm going to go back even a little further in Ephesians to Ephesians 5.1 where he said this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. So what empowers our parenting is, is the Holy Spirit and also the, ima- the um, example that God has given us. Praise the Lord. Matthew 7, 7 through 10 says this, Ask and you will be, it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if your son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks him for fish, will give him a serpent? Right? In Luke's, it goes on to say, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give gifts, good gifts to those who ask? Praise the Lord. In Luke 11, 9 through 13, he says, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if your son asks for a fish, will Instead of a fish, give him a serpent, or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So it says, tells us one, two things. God is a good father who gives good gifts to his children. Praise the Lord. One of my favorite things in Thanksgiving and Christmas is, is um, deviled eggs. And there's no devil in them, you know. But uh, I, I can't imagine, every time I have this, I think about this and, and think that God gives good gifts to his children. I wouldn't think about, hey, why don't you have a scorpion, son? Uh, you know. Um, and God gives us good gifts. He gives gifts good to those who ask. And he says, won't he give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? We get the Holy Spirit when we come to Christ in our lives. Praise the Lord. We like to say in theology, there's one baptism of the Holy Spirit, but many fillings. We should be constantly seeking the filling of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. I want to, I want to read these uh, verses again in Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 with you. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That, that line, in the Lord, is important. I mean, in a way that honors the Lord. So we don't obey our parents, as we'll see later when they ask us to do something that would be dishonoring to God or break one of his commands. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. First point today. Children should honor and obey their parents in the Lord. It's part of the Ten Commandments, right? See that in Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and mother, that, that your days may be long in the land, and the Lord your God is giving you. So, for society, it's going to go better if children obey their parents. True? And we're commanded to do it. It's right. It's the right thing to do. Obeying is about behavior. Honoring is about attitude, right? Obeying, you do what they ask you to do unless it was something that God has forbid. And honoring is the attitude in which you do it. Obeying, in this way, 
happens while you're living in the home as a child, and there comes a, a, a day where you leave the home and you don't obey in the same way. True? That's why a man should leave his father and love, mother and cleave to his wife, right? But honoring goes on throughout our life. We never stop honoring our parents. Amen? And he says, it's going to go well for you if you do that. Second thing I want us to see, when children are honored and obey their parents, they are blessed and society is blessed. Proverbs 1, 8 and 9, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. In other words, they're beautiful things to have. Do what your parents are asking you to do. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, I think you will be able to understand why I put this up here. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. The come times of what? Hmm. For people will be lovers of self. You just heard somebody recently said, they were talking to somebody, um, actually it was my daughter, and she said the person they were talking to said, I, know, I, never, I no longer believe in God, I believe in myself. Okay. Uh, that's not probably going to work out for you as well as you think it's going to. Well, come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, and what's the next thing? Disobedient to their parents. Continue to read. Ungrateful. Ungrateful. Unholy. Heartless. Unappeasable. Slanderous. Without self control. Brutal. Not loving good. Treacherous. Reckless. Swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. I, I take that to mean that as we have grace for the battle, the spiritual battle, what happens in the family matters. I believe our purpose is to make disciples who make disciples, to make followers of Christ who love God and love others. And I believe the best disciple-making institution in the world is the family. And I believe that's why Satan is trying to attack it and destroy it. What you saw in the passage today is you, from Matthew is she said, if you, being evil, know how to do good things for your children, how much more the Heavenly Father. That means that within parents, there is, and I understand there are some people that neglect their parental duty, but I believe that most parents want what's best for their kids, don't you? There's an instinct in us to protect and care for our kids. I believe when parents are absent, children are vulnerable. When parents are absent from their roles and responsibilities that God gives them, then children become vulnerable. There's a reason that people like Hitler said, let us educate your children, right? Understanding that if he was given the children, he could poison their minds. We, as a church, must support parents and train up parents to lead their children. Because when society has a society in which parents are honored and children obey their parents, things go well. Amen?
What a beautiful and powerful passage that is. Third thing I want us to observe here is we should teach children to honor and obey their parents in the Lord. It's just something that we should, we should train them up to do. And in other words, it's not just the parents that are about that, but as a society, we should remove things that um, show dishonor to parents. I, mean, got to pass, uh, I think it's dishonoring to parents when places like libraries say, we're not going to let you know what your eight-year-old checked out of the library, right? I think it's dishonoring to, to parents when school districts say, well, we, we can do this and you don't have to have any input in it. Would you agree? So we teach our people that there is an importance of parenting. Proverbs 15.5 says, A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. So if we want to have wise children, we'll teach them to listen to the instruction of their parents. In the Lord. Not, not parents who would ask them. I, I understand that there are times that parental rights need to be severed because of abusive situations. I've worked with adoptive parents. I have adoptive children. But the general practice should be supporting and encouraging parents. Amen? Four. When we say in the Lord, we mean in ways that honor Christ. We do not encourage children to disobey God even when their parents tell them to do so. That's not rebellion for a child to submit to a higher authority and say, I would really love to honor you, Dad, but, Mom, but I can't do that because that's disobeying God. Now, how often is that the case? I would say not the majority of times, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. Five, fathers do not provoke your children to anger. Did you say that? Fathers, take, take the lead. Lead in leading your family. Love your wife in such a way that your children honor her. Amen? Wives, love your husbands in such a way that your children honor him. We should not be having parenting situations where one parent is, is teaching the children to dishonor the other parent. We shouldn't have situations where in front of the children, one parent is overruling the other parent without prayfully getting together and coming as a unified group. Amen? I don't like it um, when I see one, one parent go, well, I, your mom worries too much. Just go ahead and go out there and don't wear a coat even though mom just said to wear a coat. I think that's just teaching them to dishonor, right? Come together, pray together, work together. You're a team. And, and fathers, you're provoking your children to anger. How do you do that? By neglecting them, by being in angry rage. Those kind of things should not be there. Six, fathers, nourish and raise up your children in the Lord through the discipline and instruction. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 said this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So the first thing I would say is a good parent models what he's asking his children to do. It's a lot easier to get children to do what you're doing than to do what you're saying. It starts with us loving God. And these words that I, go to the next slide here, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Not just in your mind, they should be in your heart. You should be, fathers, seeking to live out the word of God. Mothers, seeking to live out the, the word of God. You shall teach them diligently. How? Diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lay down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorpost of your houses and your gates. So what he's, what he's saying there to the, to the Israelites is, be lovers of God, seek to follow the commands God has given in your life, and then instruct diligently your children. 
talk about it all the time. Everything you talk about is saturated with the truth of who God is. In that day, they, they put it on the doorpost of the house. We don't have the doorpost of the house, but maybe, what's in your house? Do you have stuff in your house on the walls and paintings and arts that points to the goodness of God? Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. These are Proverbs are general truths, and, and here's a general truth for you. Proverbs twenty two fifteen: Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Proverbs 29, 17. Discipline your son, and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod of reproof gives wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 3, 12, for the Lord reproves whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Discipline's a good thing when it's done in a loving manner, Right? Our Heavenly Father disciplines us. Look at Hebrews 12, 4 through 9. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there who his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of the spirits and live? Now, Discipline's important, and so is instruction in the Lord. And I like what Josh McDowell said when he said that rules without relationship lead to rebellion. The point of dis discipline is to love your children in ways that bring glory and honor to God. It's important to know that even when um, our fathers don't do what they should, we have a Heavenly Father who does do the right thing. Praise the Lord. But before I get to those folks who may be saying, you don't understand the situation of my parents, or what, what do you do if you come from a broken family? What do you do if it's hard to see God as a father because my father wasn't what he should have been, or he wasn't there, I don't know my father? Before we even get to there, let's get first to the, what the Bible would like us to do in regard to being parents. And let's say, if you're a parent here, what are some things that you could do one, get involved in your child's life. Understand what's happening. Understand what music they like, what things they listen. Listen to hear their heart. Understand what's going on. As you raise them up, do things that are age appropriate to the age they're at. Don't exasperate them by expecting them to act like 16-year-olds when they're three, right? Love them. Care for them. Don't, don't face their sin as if you have no idea what it would be to, to, to sin, right? your child lies to you, don't go like, I have no idea how anyone could ever lie. I would never do such a thing. But, but really remind them of the gospel. The reason this is important is because sin gets in the way of being who God calls us to be. And that's why we're so thankful that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Because we have power to live differently. Let's ask God for forgiveness for that. Why don't you ask God for forgiveness for that? And ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit so you can live differently. Isn't that part of parenting kids? Get an instruction. Get, get discipline. What about instruction in the Lord? Do you talk to your kids about the Lord? Do you use your chances as a grandparent to talk to them? There's a couple of resources I like to use. One is um, blessings. It's just... 
prayers from the Bible that you can pray in the evening as a blessing over your child. I find that really helpful. Another thing is catechisms, and I'd be glad if you fill out your connection card to, to send these resources to you. Um, I, I tell you this, anytime we talk about parents, I don't know about you, uh, but I always feel like I could do a lot better job. How about you? I think all of us go. Oh. So I got a long ways to go, but there's some things I have found helpful. I, I found reading the questions from the catechism, like why did God, who created everything? Why were we created in the evening? Just one question a night is a helpful thing to do. To pray at meals, pray, pray in the evening. Um, Take opportunities when you're watching television to stop it and go, is, is, what's right about what we just saw that the Bible would agree with? What, what about what we just saw is not true? Or we will, as our family sometimes say, what is this show trying to get you to do that God wouldn't want you to do? Right? Even commercials, right? right? Are you really going to get happy if you just get all that stuff? So I think instructing people in the Lord and being intentional in how you do it. Have a plan on how you're going to do that. If you're here and you're, you're not a parent, then I would say to you, um, honor your parents and, and promote family. Praise the Lord. If you're here, let me, let me take this one. If you're here and your relationship with your parents was not good, Maybe it was abusive, destructive. You know what the scripture says, that, that, that even if your father and mother forsake you, God will take you in. Don't buy the lie that I had to have a good relationship with my father to have a good relationship with my heavenly father. That's not scriptural. Scripture doesn't say that. I, uh, I worked with a young girl, and, and she was like, my counselor told me that I'm never going to find peace in my life until I find peace with my earthly father. Her earthly father, she finally tracked him down, and he swore at her and said, I don't even know why you were looking for me. And what we had to say to her is, you don't need a right relationship with your earthly father to have a right relationship with your heavenly father. Praise the Lord. You need to, you need to remove that lie. A bad example of what a father should be like doesn't keep you from a good example of the Heavenly Father, right? I, I praise the Lord to see families that change. I can give you an example of families after family where, where dad and mom weren't there, but now they are there for their own kids because there's a new beginning in Jesus Christ. Amen? You're not imprisoned by your, your past parents' behavior. You're, the, the I remember praying over someone and saying, I want you to know as clear as the Word of God says it, that your identity, your defining moment, isn't in what your parent did to you. It's what Christ did for you. Your defining moment isn't that abuse you had in your past. Your defining moment is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ who's calling you to arise to new life. It's not going to be easy. I'm not making it, hey, just snap my finger. But we're going to... Go to the Word. We're going to pray together. We're going to weep together. And the Word of God is going to saturate into you, and you're going to realize that your identity and your destiny are in Jesus Christ and the grace of his holy name. And you do not have to repeat the pattern of your parents. Do you need to hear that today? Do you know somebody who does need to hear that? As, as we sing... 10,000 reasons to close our service today. Think about the words. A thousand times I failed, but the Lord is there for me. Amen? So whether you're a parent or you have parents, know your identity and your destiny and your purpose are found in Jesus Christ.